Hello again, and uh, thank you for listening to this sixth update on COVID-19, recorded today, the 1st of May, 2020. So a, just a couple of topics I wanted to cover this time. So first of all, the uh, answering the question of well, why don't we just test everybody for COVID if we really want to eradicate this, why not test everybody to help us with that? And also an update on some uh, new information about remdesivir, the antiviral drug. So starting off with the question of why don't we test everybody for this? So first of all, there's the issue of capacity. And so we'd need to have a lot of laboratory space. We'd have to have all the machines, the PCR machines. We'd have to have lots of swabs for putting in people's noses and throats. And we also have to have the chemicals used to make the PCR test work called reagent. And all of those are in limited supply. So we, we can't test everyone in the population. That would be just practically impossible. But on top of that, there's a separate issue that if we do test everybody, it does lead to some additional problems, which I'll cover in the next slides, uh, which make things a little bit more confusing as to whether this is really all that helpful to test everyone. So if you look back uh, to update number four, I talked about how when you do have any test, there's always a bit of uncertainty. So if you've got this person on the left here who definitely has COVID, when you test them, nearly always, you'll get a result that says it's positive, and we call that a true positive. But just occasionally, it'll the test will not work for some reason and give a false negative reading. And then the person on the right here who does not have COVID, most of the time the test will be accurate and say that uh, this person is negative, but then you'll get occasional false positives. So either way, you can get errors in the test. And every single test we do has these errors both directions. So if we take a, a population, for example, just conveniently with a million people in this population, you can see, and in this population, there are 1,000 or 0.1% of that total population definitely has COVID and the remaining 999,000 do not have it. So if you can go and test this entire population of a million, and we'll say for argument's sake that this test is 99% accurate at detecting COVID in the people who do have it. So that the true positive rate, 99% and the false uh, negative rate is 1%. So Based on that, 99% of 1,000 will give you 990 people with COVID will test positive, but you'll have this 1% uh, who test negative. So you get 10 false negatives in that group. And if we keep those figures similar, they wouldn't necessarily be the same. But in, in this, we'll just say again, of the people who do not have COVID, if you test them, 99% will be right and will have a true a negative result, but you'll get this 1% false positive rate. And if we then Add up, the color, add up the rows, so we add up the true tests that are positive, the tests are negative, to form these ones. You can then see that of the 10,980 test results that come back positive, only 990, or about 9% of those are correct. So you've gone from a population that has, if you're able to work out definitely accurately, 0.1% uh, being positive, and now you've gone up to about just over 1% of the population are apparently testing positive for COVID. And of the people who test negative, so there's 989,020, um, nearly all of those will be correct. And so if you go from at the start doing no test at all, your chance of being negative is 99.9% and you take that up to 99.999%. So it's not a big change and you're falsely going to reassure 10 people. So obviously this looks terrible. If you test that many people, all these extra false positives really distorts the picture and gives you a very artificial and incorrect reading of what's going on in your community. And so if we change the figures a bit, and so say now, okay, same population a million, uh, but this time it's a lot worse. So you've got 100,000 people or 10% of the population have it, and 90% uh, do not have it. And the same figures of the 99% uh, the test positive, and you've got the 1% false negatives, and again, of the people who don't have it, 99% accurately uh, detected as negative, but you've got this 1% false positive rate. So in this situation, you go up for your total number of tests is 108,000, but majority of them, so 91.7% are correct. So it really looks like when you do these tests, it depends on the population. And if you're testing people where it's more likely, so in this situation here, either you've got a place that's much worse affected, or alternatively, you're just testing people who are likely to have symptoms of COVID or are very likely to have been exposed. It makes the test appear much more accurate. And if you then say, all right, what about taking it the other way? And if there were a, a population of a million, but only a hundred cases and do the same calculations with the same figures, this time you do again, test just over 10,000 will be positive, but only 1% of those are true positives and the rest are false positives. So if you do these tests, you've got to think about, all right, the interpretation depends on the population study. And if we've got this uh, blitz coming in Victoria, where the uh, premiers uh, asked us to test 100,000 asymptomatic people, so people with no symptoms in the next few weeks, that this is going to lead to 
uh, uh, certainly it's very likely to be a number of false positives. Now, we don't know what the actual figure for the sensitivity, which is that number of people who have the infection who test positive, and the specificity, which is the people who don't have it, who test negative. We don't know for certain what these are because it's new tests. And also we don't have a kind of a, another test to say, right, well, here's a way of absolutely confirming it to prove how accurate the tests we're doing are. And on top of that, there's lots of laboratories that have developed their own tests. So we, each one's going to be slightly different. And it's there's not a kind of a, a generalizable figure for just how accurate these tests are. So uh, obviously this is pretty complicated to kind of explain this in a seven second soundbite. So when we do this blitz in the next few weeks of testing all these asymptomatic people in Victoria for COVID, it's going to have some interesting results. And so just think about the uh, chief health officer having to explain all the complications of this in a seven second soundbite on the news. It's not going to be easy to do, but it means that we probably will have some possibly quite alarming numbers coming through in the next few weeks where we will get all these people who are apparently positive, but, keep in mind that quite a few of those may well be false positives. And so also, if you've read some of the recent stuff on the media about uh, you know, testing whole populations of little towns in Italy or testing whole populations of, of uh, no, nursing homes and things, and they say, oh, we've found all these people who have got COVID, but were asymptomatic. It's possible that some, and possibly even the majority of those didn't actually have it, but just had a false positive. So just keep that in mind even though we are going to have some probably some relatively bad news coming from this testing blitz it may not be quite as bad as it seems so the second topic is remdesivir now i cover that in the last update number five uh, and at that stage we just had one study released on that suggesting that the side effects exceeded the benefits uh, from a study in china but since then uh, we've now had a, another study coming through this time from the us where it, in this one it, it gave some quite different results and in this one the, uh, the the benefits of this drug looked like it was improving the time to imp uh, to recovery. So the patients who did not get it took 15 days to recover, whereas the patients who got the drug took it down to 11 days to recover. And on top of that, there was a slight reduction in the death rate for the people who got it. So the people who did not get it died at a rate of about 11.5%, and the people who did get the drug died at a rate of 8%. Now, this was not a, a big enough difference to say that in statistical calculations you'd say this was not big enough of a difference to say this is a true difference it may be if you did the study in more people but it's not enough at this stage to say it's definitely reducing the death rate so no, this does look good and um, the americans have come out and with dr fauci saying that this is a game changer and this is going to be standard of care there now is it a game changer well if you compare it to the situation when penicillin came along uh, in the last century. Um, so at that stage, the most common cause of pneumonia, which is called pneumococcal infection, when you had a severe infection with that, the people who got no treatment before penicillin was invented, their chance of dying was between 80 to 90%, so only between 10 and 20% survived. Once penicillin came along, that changed the situation to 10 to 20% uh, dying and, and 80 to 90% surviving. So that was that's a real game changer. This is not that kind of game changer, but it's a good start. And you know, there's also a few reasons to be skeptical. So when this study uh, in the US was first started, the specified outcome of what they were looking for with the remdesivir was this kind of eight point scale of how severe the infection was and to see that that was gonna improve. And then halfway through the study, they suddenly decided that they were gonna change it to this time to recovery instead of this initial plan that they had. It's always a bit strange for a, a study to suddenly change the goalposts right in the middle of the study. So that does raise a few alarm bells. And on top of that, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, when you do a study like this, any time the, the drug companies say uh, developing a study, they're always going to look at what patients to include and what patients not to include in the study that are going to give them the best chance of showing a difference that obviously is going to work in their favour. And so when we get a, a benefit from any study, probably when you then take this into the real world and give it to all patients, even the ones who didn't meet the criteria to get into this study, probably the benefit's only about half as much as it is in the study. And the other bit of bad news, I guess, for us here in Australia is now that this has been promoted as standard of care in the US, the chance of us being able to get any of this drug in Australia is not very high. So unfortunately, it's uh, potentially good for the US, but it's maybe not going to be available here for a while. So finally, I'd just also uh, like to take the chance to thank some people. Um, so 
at the hospital, we had all these donations of food and snacks. Uh, so for example, the group called Alex Makes Meals have uh, provided a whole lot of meals for the staff who are obviously busy working with general patients as well as the COVID patients. And this has been absolutely fantastic and really appreciated by the staff, the people who provided this food uh, for the staff to take home and have a, an easy quick meal rather than having to go home after working hard and then to uh, and then prepare their own meal. So that's been absolutely fantastic. We really appreciate that. Also, um, we've had a, a young man called uh, Ben Teeley who's got a 3D printer and has made these little things you can see on this nurse's hair here, where this is used to attach the surgical mask onto the, onto the person's face so that rather than having the mask pressing against behind your ears, where on an eight hour shift, that does become pretty uncomfortable after a, after one or two hours of that. And so this takes the pressure off your ears and makes it much more comfortable to wear a mask for a long time. So thank you very much, Ben, for that. That's been fantastic. And finally, we've had a whole lot of people donating to the Austin's Research Fund. Um, and uh, we've been able to put that money towards studies, which we're going to be involved in studies of treatment of COVID. We're looking at studies of the immunology of COVID, looking at why some patients uh, do get sicker than others, and also looking at the influence of the, uh, the microbiome in the, uh, in the intestines to see if that has any difference in terms of people who do well versus people who get sicker. So thank you very much to all the people who are doing these donations. It's really fantastic and we really do appreciate you helping out with the staff at this moment. So thanks again for listening.